So I'm really excited to introduce our four guests. Um, so they all have different data related roles at Google Cloud. Um, so we have Evan, who is a technical curriculum developer. And we have Amy, who is a developer relations engineer. And we have Alex, who is another technical curriculum developer. And Wesley, who is a cloud machine learning engineer. So very excited to have these guests to share some of their uh, experiences with you all. Um, and thank you to those of you who sent us in some questions ahead of time. I know that our guests have prepared some answers for you and we will have some time at the end where you can put questions in the chat box as well. So that's it for me, take it away. Thanks so much, Claire. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Evan. Uh, as Claire mentioned uh, in the awesome intros, I'm a technical curriculum developer. I'm joined by a whole host of other Googlers. We're thrilled. If, if you can't tell, I'm a little retro today. I'm supporting the uh, Bring Serif logo back for Google. Um, but we're, we're extremely excited to be here. We'll keep this a little bit informal uh, in, in the sense of we'll, we're going to give you the gamut of my experience with what's going on in the course. Obviously, we're promoting a new specialization that we just launched. But we want to leave a lot of time at the end for your questions. We, we got a lot of good questions in before the uh, the, the webinar started. So we definitely want to entertain and kind of keep this more uh, collaborative and less luxury because certainly you have enough lectures uh, and quizzes that you're going to take inside the specialization. And you're going to, you know, unfortunately today you don't have the option to pause my face, uh, which you certainly do when you actually take the specialization itself. Uh, so one of the first things a lot of folks want to ask uh, is, well, first of all, great to meet all of you. I'm really, really excited to kind of spend the next hour with you together with uh, Wes, Amy, um, uh, Alex, and myself. Uh, what I'd like to do first is we're going to cover what is it that we just launched? Who is it targeted for? Uh, I really like showing some cooler uh, visualizations or some of the things that you're going to get your, um, your feet wet with playing around in the actual TensorFlow code that you're going to be working with. And then we'll also show you, like, if you wanted to get started a little bit early, um, we're going to give you a, a promotional code uh, for one month free of the, um, uh, the courses that we offer. So if you can get the entire specialization done in a month, which is a, a very, very difficult task, uh, but some people have done it. Uh, you can actually get the entire course for free, which is kind of cool. And so we'll give you that. We're gonna make you stay to the end of the webinar to get that, uh, that special promotional code as well. And we'll also record this and any of the links that we're mentioning we'll share out uh, as well. Uh, but first and foremost, let's see if I can just share my entire screen here. And uh, what I wanted to do is first show you what, what we actually launched this week. So as you're all familiar, a specialization on Coursera consists of multiple different courses that you take as part of the cohort uh, over time. And if you've already taken the, what we call the first specialization in this series, which is just machine learning with TensorFlow on Google Cloud Platform, that's the first specialization, uh, then you're already familiar with how the specializations work and what types of labs that you're taking. Uh, but if this is the first time you're new to Coursera or you're new to the Google Cloud courses that are being offered, uh, just know that there are actually two different machine learning specializations. There's one that's just machine learning, and then there's this one that we just launched, uh, which is uh, three uh, uh, new courses, advanced machine learning courses, with two more coming at the end of November. So let's take a look at what actually you are going to learn inside of this uh, specialization. Uh, so first and foremost, if you already have a background in Python or R, or you've worked with uh, big data sets before, and you have a, an experience with machine learning, uh, you'll be taken into a rapid fire review of building a productionalized machine learning model on GCP. So this is an end to end starting from data exploration, feature engineering, building different types of models, neural networks, and getting them to actually run in a, in a scalable serverless fashion on the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, if that seems like it's a, wow, that's, that's a little bit over my head. This is an, a capstone of the first five courses of that first specialization, which again is already launched. But if you've already taken that, or if you already have experience inside of machine learning, you're welcome to start and jump right in with course one. Uh, so that's, that's the first one, which will give you a good a survey end to end. And by the end of that, you'll walk away with a productionalized model that actually you're gonna be building web APIs to do the predictions. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, after that, course number two is about how to do machine learning at scale. So one of the greatest things about using a cloud platform, like, like Google Cloud Platform is, all right, well, you can build a really cool machine learning model locally using um, like a IPython notebook and get it to run and get it to train. But what happens if you've got to serve it out to uh, you know, thousands of different requests that are happening simultaneously? How do you scale it out? What are the performance considerations? So there's a lot of the, oh, gotcha moments 
where you've got a trained model, but you want to actually serve a production ML model. That's course number two. Uh, I won't hide the fact that course three is my favorite because image understanding with, with TensorFlow is a completely different type of data, training and classifying images, much like if you've seen Google Photos before, some of the same type of models that go in behind Google Photos, you're gonna learn about the history of working with images as data, like pixel data, and how to actually convert that into, uh, into a format that a neural network could then classify using something called a convolutional neural network. That's one of my, uh, my favorite courses in there. And then uh, after that, we're gonna be launching in uh, uh, November, uh, how to do time series prediction. We're just finishing up the videos for that. And last but not least, building actual recommendation systems, which are just different flavors of models. So these, the first three are accessible now. And again, we'll give you that promo, core, uh, promo code for that uh, a little bit later. Uh, so let's dive into a little bit more of the specifics. I've got about four more minutes of general overview, and then I'm going to pass it over to Wes, who's going to talk about what are some of the cool things that Google Cloud Platform and the clients who use Google Cloud Platform can do. Uh, so if you're, you're waiting for some of the ways it can actually be used, uh, Wes is going to give you a little bit more of that. But if machine learning is new to you in general, or if you just want a quick uh, review, some of the things that we go into are you'll get a lot of the hands-on practice in building these interactive labs, but you'll also get a lot of the really good theory behind it. For example, if you had just a linear model here and you had didn't know uh, it wasn't a deep neural network, for example, a deep neural network might have a bunch of different neurons and different layers to try to classify these two classes of points in this swirl, uh, the linear model might not be able to do it. And it's, it's gonna basically try to say, all right, well, using all these features that I have, is there a possibility that I could divide this data and really understand, well, all of the orange parts are in this part of the swirl and all the blue parts are in this part of the swirl. As you see, it's failing to do that. It's struggling and it's trying really, really hard and it can't. And throughout the course, mainly in the first specialization, you're gonna learn the different types of models. Like, what's the difference? When, when would I wanna use something like a linear regression model? When, will, when could I do something like a classification model? and uh, what types of different classification models are out there. You can actually linearly separate model, uh, linearly separate um, data points using a linear model, absolutely. But the more complex the data set, like you see this swirl, that's when you go into more advanced model types, like a neural network or a deep neural network, which has a ton of hidden layers as well. Uh, and the, what you're looking at here is just a TensorFlow playground. So we, we teach a lot of the theory of what are hidden layers, what are neurons, what are features. So if all this is brand new to you, we're not just gonna throw you into the deep end with TensorFlow code and expect you to, to, to swim without learning some of the basics of neural networks as well. That said, if you're on the more advanced side of the spectrum, I have really good news for you. We'll, uh, I'm gonna post the link to the, it's a public repository, or if you're very good at uh, just searching Google very quickly, it's under Google Cloud Platform Training Data Analyst, Machine Learning Deep Dive. These are all 10 courses in the, special, in the two specializations. The first five being all of the code, all of the IPython notebooks for running all the models, which you're gonna be doing inside of your labs, already available to you for uh, on demand if you wanted to just run those yourselves. But again, if you wanted to just learn the theory, practice with a little bit more of the instruction, uh, inside of the Coursera course, uh, you're gonna be given uh, naturally all the videos and all the theory that build up into doing some of these labs. For example, I was mentioning one of my favorite courses is the um, convolutional neural networks as part of the image classification uh, course. So you're gonna learn things like, all right, well, here's the TensorFlow um, uh, code that actually builds. Let's try classifying our images. It's a, a handwritten image data set. With a linear model, what's the difference between a linear model and a deep neural network model? What does dropout mean? And why do we use regularization techniques to make models a little bit less fragile? And then my personal favorite, well, what happens if a deep neural network doesn't, it is a little bit hamstrung by uh, the type of image data? And then you'll learn on the rise of the fame of the convolutional neural network. And again, if you've already experienced some TensorFlow, you're welcome to play around with these labs. Or if it's brand new to you, or if you want to get a little bit more training, these are all of the labs that you're going to be walking through, and all of the solutions will be provided for you as well. So that is the lightning tour. Again, the, the, each of the courses, the five courses in the advanced specialization, will take about one or two weeks to complete. So if a lot of this is just rapid fire, again, we'll record this whole webinar for you to get the access to the links and the promotion for taking the one month free. But our main goal here is to get you excited about some of the things that you can do with machine learning. So at that point, I could definitely go on and on about some of the other cool things that are in there, but I, I want to pass the mic to uh, other my awesome uh, esteemed colleagues. We, we gave you the round table of cool people uh, from, from Google today on this Friday. 
So I'll pass it over to Wes, who's gonna talk a little bit more about some of the cool things that machine learning has already done for some of the other Google clients out there. Take it away, Wes. Thanks, Evan. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Uh, I, okay. Stop me, please, if you can't see it. Uh, so my my goals for, for the next few minutes are to share with everybody a little bit of what at least one person's, uh, what it's like for at least one person to be a um, professional ML engineer, and also to talk about how Google uses its uh, engineering expertise to, to help companies. Uh, everyone, oh, all right. Everyone here is familiar with TensorFlow. Um, obviously, we've got plenty of other tools too. Uh, software is maybe the easiest place to start with what Google does. So from the, the wonkiest of all tools in the toolbox, TensorFlow, which is a library that helps you do math, to services like our translation service or vision service that don't require any sort of configuration, any sort of, uh, app dev work, you get a service right out of the box. Uh, we have tools for a variety of different developers. And the, the coworker that I stole this slide from um, has, gave this a sort of spectrum for where the, you know, the wonky tools are for data scientists and the, the easy to use tools are for people without that, that background. But I, personally, in, in my in my day to day, and I, I build a lot of proofs of concept for, for clients. I mean, the less code I have to, to write to build my models, the, the happier I am. Like, cloud machine learning engine is fantastic for serve. You build your model and you get a, a service out of it for free that auto scales or. Uh, yeah, up, up or down as, as much as as much as you want without actually having to write any of that code. And I want to talk a little bit about AutoML too. Um, I'm I'm genuinely excited about what the about the, the advances in the field here. AutoML tools are uh, so that I'll contrast them like with the Vision API there on on the right. The Vision API we we've got a, a bunch we've trained the model already. We've got a bunch of classes that it can recognize between. With AutoML and tools like it, you, you can provide it with a small set of your data and Google will generate models for you. So uh, I finished a project just on Tuesday uh, where my team built a, a service that took images that had text in different parts of them and pulled out are ident identified based on the meaning of that text. Uh, different interesting fields or interesting regions of that image, and I'm being I'm being hand wavy because we haven't really released the details. But we used AutoML for the entire thing. I, I wrote no modeling code. Nobody on our team did, which it freed me up to 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 do some of the the data science work that that I that I like doing. So I built, I defined metrics. I helped our customer visualize what our, what our model produced. I, I helped them uh, understand which classes of, of image we predicted well. Uh, one of the, our key contributions was to show that there were inconsistencies in the, in the training data. And w with this, yeah, uh, we got data relabeled and saw the accuracy of our, of our model increase 10 to 15 percent. Also, that, that, was, that was probably more time talking about software that, that I, that I uh, really have time for. Uh, so I want to talk about the, the services we, we offer to. Uh, it'll be easiest to talk about the services by mapping them onto a data science um, life cycle that, that everybody here knows. Uh, you identify your problem, come up with questions about it, do a little exploratory analysis. We can help with any or all of these um,
stages in the life cycle. And we, this is, this is what my team does. Uh, there, we've got a variety of different services, some of which are more involved than others. And uh, I'll come back to this slide so you don't need to read everything right away. Uh, the discover ML is, I think, my, my favorite part. It, we come to companies and, and have a conversation with them about what ML is, uh, also what it isn't. Uh, every discover ML that we give include some explanation of how machine learning isn't magic. So we, as, a, as an engineer, um, we sit down with people who've uh, been up to their elbows in whatever industry specific problem that, they, that, the, that they're working on. Uh, and we learn about the, the, the industry, the, what's important to the company, what's important to the whole industry in four to five days. Uh, one, uh, we brainstorm uh, what are what are the most valuable use cases, and we take our our clients here through these series of questions that you have to ask before starting every machine learning project. So um, earlier this year, I was at a mine, like a where they like an actual physical mine. They one of the use cases that we came up with was how to increase throughput in their mill while maintaining yield at whatever uh, required threshold. So that their 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 mine has con has two conveyor belts where you bring the rocks into into the grinding part. The the, the grinding area adds water and steel balls and grinds the rocks all together, grinds the ore into like this pancake batter slurry that, that gets fed into a, a, a hydrocyclone where, uh, where the centrifugal force ejects the, the lighter particles and uh, the heavier ones can be reground. And then after, after the, the slurry is the, the desired consistency, you, you add your chemicals, now it comes your, your materials. So there you've got a, a, a noisy environment with time series data, a small of a number of variables that, that you have control over, uh, and, and yield at the end. It's, it's a classic, or you can set it up anyway as a classic machine learning problem in uh, an area or in an industry that I never would have imagined working in. It's, it's really fun as a, uh, as a machine learning engineer. We offer training. Um, I won't talk about this quite as much. Uh, we'll, we'll, you can, or our company can send a, a team of engineers over to Google to learn how to build and train models similar, I think, to what, uh, much of the content is similar to what is in the specialization here. And at the at the end, there'll be a, a you've got a week to along with a Google engineer build a, a capstone project. And one I was at earlier this year again, uh, a team built a recommendation model for movie trailers, uh, having I think almost no experience in TensorFlow before the the course started. It was I, I was impressed with that team. The bulk of what we do is build proof of concept models for, for customers that have already thought about their business problem and maybe have some idea of what, uh, of what they can do. Uh, about a month ago, a team uh, worked with a, another materials extraction client that had been using high resolution images to figure out where they wanted to want, wanted to mine but the high resolution images were uh, were, were manual in process uh, they had another process that was completely automatic but the images were low resolution so the team built uh, using a state of the art model uh, a uh, pair of adversarial networks, one which took low resolution images, 
generated or fabricated higher resolution images and another uh, network that just compared fabricated or tried, tried to guess whether an example was fabricated or whether it was the actual high resolution image. Uh, this is, I'm not, not, not going to get into the model any more than that, but it, this was published just a couple years ago. So the team that built this, they were one of the first, I mean, it, it was adversarial networks like this are just now being implemented into the TensorFlow. They were one of the first users of, of any of that code. They, they discovered bugs and gaps as they were building like that the version of TensorFlow that was deployed to uh, their, their images, it had the ability to train models, but not actually any machinery built into TensorFlow to generate predictions. So the company came out of it with um, something they couldn't have built themselves and the team got to implement a research paper and make TensorFlow better in the process. And then the, we, for those cases where in original research does need to be done, you can, we, we can assemble a division of Google engineers to work on a problem together with, um, with several engineers from a, from a line of business too, from a client company. You come in and we'll, we'll build a, an actual product. We're not just gonna build a proof of concept with the advanced systems lab, but we'll do, yeah, we, we may come out of the engagement with a new paper and a, a service that looks just like any other Google product that, that, a, that client company can use. Uh, it's it's really fun being um, being an, an engineer on on this team. We get to work on new problems all the time, and make ha, ha, have a lot of impact. Uh, we can yeah I'll talk about things later on in the Q and A, but uh, I'd like to pass it over to Amy to talk about pipelines. Right. Oh, I pause my share. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Attempting to share my screen here. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, machine learning workflows or, or pipelines, and you can substitute data science for machine learning every time I say machine learning. And, and so um, I, I wanted to say just a little bit about what I do. I'm, so I'm a developer relations engineer um, with, with an academic background in AI and a, and a focus on machine learning and, and big data, um, what I do at Google. And um, a lot of, so we're sort of uh, public facing engineers. A lot of what we do is we talk to developers, both, um, both from small companies or, you know, startups and, and from big companies. And so, so we hear a lot about what people are struggling with, you know, what their pain points are, and, um, and it's pretty illuminating. <laughs> so, so I wanted to share just a few slides that, that um, talked about some of that, some, some of what we hear and and um, some of what, what people are thinking about and learning can, can help them when they um, s start to, to build machine learning systems. So um, as probably everyone has figured out, building um, a proof of concept system, you know, is often pretty straightforward. It's, um, trouble comes when, when you sort of start to scale it out and take it to production. And once, once you do that, you, you often notice all sorts of issues. So um, typically what you build um, as a prototype is really only a very small piece of what it turns out you need to pay attention to when, when you productionize something. And so um, these can be both problems of scale, um, you know, and sort of paying attention to, to all the bits and pieces that you need to to suddenly focus on when you try to keep a system in long-term 
continuous operation. All, all sorts of troubles show up. And th this is a, a cool picture that comes from um, a very interesting paper that I would recommend. We, we can put a link to the PDF in, in the notes at the end. Um, the paper is called Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. And it sort of suggests that um, the, the ML code part of a machine learning system is really only a very small part of, of all the other things that you need to, to pay attention to. And so, so this, this is actually um, pretty important. Whenever you start to, to build out a machine learning system, you'll hit all this stuff. And yet it's sort of not really the focus of many um, more theoretical machine learning courses. And, and so, um, so why, why do things suddenly be, become harder? There, there are all sorts of reasons. And, and we sort of hear the same things over and over again from, from customers. There, there are a lot of re reoccurring themes. And one really big one is um, is something that everyone views as, as sort of boring, <laughs> I think, um, almost everyone does, you know, but it, it's it's necessary and it, it, and it ends up um, taking so much more time um, often than, than people think it will. And, and that's just um, cleaning and processing data at large amounts of data at scale with with your little proof of concept system, you, you probably have sort of a curated data set and you're like, oh yeah, this is gonna work. And then when you start to, to deal with moving around large amounts of data and, and cleaning it up, it gets much, much harder. Um, kind of similarly, uh, scaling out, you know, uh, once, once you start training with large amounts of data, maybe using complex machine learning models, Maybe you decide, all right, I really need to do distributed training so that my um, training cycle doesn't take three months to do. <laughs> um, th then you start to need to, to deal with infrastructure issues. There, there's something really interesting called um, training serving skew. Um, there, there are different names for it as well, but it relates to um, you, you, you'll be doing your model training maybe with um, using um, batch data. And then when, when it comes to serve your, your trained model, so that means you use your trained model to make predictions, um, maybe you, you have an incoming data stream and you need to make sure that the instances you send to your trained model to make predictions um, from, you, you need to make sure that you're, you're processing that data in the same way that you did when you were, were training. Um, and if you're not, careful, you'll, you'll get a, a disconnect there um, because often th those are completely different systems, maybe even running on different clusters. You know, you trained one on one cluster, you're serving on another one. You need to be very careful that you're processing your incoming data the same way. There's often all sorts of unexpected interactions between components. Um, one reason is that um, kind of, you know, interestingly, and machine learning systems can be more complicated than sort of, you know, the usual software system you're, you're used to because um, one, one uh, common reason is because the, the data influences the component behavior and that can sometimes um, erode the abstractions that you're trying to build. There's often um, all sorts of problems with data freshness, model drift, you know, you, the new characteristics of your data um, may make your model less accurate. How do you detect that? And there's all sorts of requirements for um, tracking and monitoring what's happening, being able to, to reproduce workflows and all sorts of things. So lots more. <laughs> so so some, some of the things that, that can, can lead to trouble um, that, that we hear a, a lot of people, you know, sort of tripping up over and over again are just just taking like taking a notebook that a data, data scientist created and and oftentimes um, when you productionize something, you'll end up with black box components that maybe um, only two or three people understand <laughs> um, because you sort of compartmentalized what you're building. Um, maybe you're, you're not um, continuing to validate your, your data the, the way you, um, you should be. Um, maybe your data becomes biased or, or stale. And um, maybe you're, you're not monitoring um, 
the accuracy, the ongoing accuracy of your, your model properly. So um, there's lots of stuff that, that can help uh, address these issues and, and more that I didn't have time to talk about. And, and there's kind of like a, a subcategory. Oh, I may have made that little mark. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> not sure if I did or not. Um, I, I see I see a scribble on my screen that that if everyone else can see, um, you'll just have to ignore it. Um, the um, the there's a way of, of of thinking about building machine learning workflows that's kind of analogous to to DevOps. So um, I, I like to use the term ML ops. And th there's a whole category of um, things that you can do to kind of ameliorate these these issues that come up that fall into the the category of of ML ops. And l so let me say a little bit bit more about those. So if if you go back to that um, diagram that I showed. Um, Clear, it, is there a way for, do you see that red mark and is there a way for me to remove it? Uh, I see it, yeah. I don't know if there's a way. I was trying to find out if there was a way for me to. <laughs> okay. It's, it's part of your brand now, Amy. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Part of my brand. All right. <laughs> um, okay, so if you go back to, to that diagram I showed earlier that kind of hints that that um, machine learning code is oh thanks whoever did that <laughs> that machine learning code is is only a um, small part of all the things that you need to pay attention to it um, it sort of lets you realize that that if if you formalize um, the machine learning life cycle with the help of a workflow framework that that can really um, do a lot to address some of these issues like so for example if if you say you know we're, we're going to use a machine learning workflow framework let's start with with um, creating building blocks for all of the different things that we need to pay attention to that are these building blocks are reusable and composable and scalable in the sense that we can um we can scale up the the um CPU, you know, GPU, et cetera, resources behind them, the amount of memory that, that each building block is using as, as we need to. We have, um, say, we, we, our machine learning framework is going to provide support for data and model versioning. This becomes really important when, when you're, you're doing a lot of machine learning um, uh, runs or, or jobs. You need to keep track of how the um, results track back to the particular version of, of the model that you, you trained or the particular version of the data that you used to train it. Um, you, you'd like such a framework to support controlled experimentation, you know, help you do things like hyperparameter tuning, help you do things like evaluate your, your models when they're trained. Um, you'd like such a framework to, to you know, help you support monitoring of your results, uh, leaving an audit trail that, that you can um, um, trace back uh, what, what happened when, you checkpointing, automatic checkpointing for you, automatic logging for you. Um, you you'd like support for um, scheduling jobs and having um, event triggered jobs. You know, if we get a new batch of data in, that's going to trigger a um, training run, for example. Um, support for incremental learning, um, iteratively training a model when new data comes in, S support for collaboration. All, all, you can imagine all sorts of things that machine learning frameworks could provide that um, would, would help with some of these issues that I talked about earlier. And so, um, and, and you can see this, this uh, great work of art um, on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, that kind of suggests, like you know, here's here might be one simple workflow that you'd want a um, machine learning workflow framework to to support. Where um, and and um, often you can think of these things as as DAGs, <laughs> directed acyclic graphs. 
So here, you know, we, we do a step where we clean and process some data. Maybe we do some feature engineering experiments. We generate two different um, feature sets um, that we want to compare. We, we do distributed training. Um, so we scale out our training. With, then maybe we want to do some model analysis, compare um, the, the two different models we learn based on our two different feature sets, see which one worked better then maybe serve one of them at scale. And, and that's just, just one simple example. And, and so, um, so I hope I, I kind of convinced you that, um, that it's inter interesting and useful to, to pay attention to life cycle management, machine learning workflow frameworks, as well as, as that little um, orange box in the middle. And, and there is a lot of interesting work going on in this area right now. Um, and, and I have a theory about that, which is that, you know, finally, just in the last few years, people are sort of getting a grip on the, um, the core machine learning frameworks, things like TensorFlow and, and um, other comparable frameworks, and sort of, you know, um, getting a toehold on how to use them effectively. And now they're starting to finally have the mental bandwidth to pay attention to all this other stuff properly. And so there, there is a lot of interesting, um, work going on right now. Um, I, I won't mention in, anything in particular, except for I would be remiss if I didn't give a little bit of a shout out to um, Kubeflow, which is a, a Google initiated open source project to build a machine learning stack on top of Kubernetes. Um, and we can put a link to that in the notes as well. It's very early days for Kubeflow, but it's, it's interesting, uh, something to keep an eye on. Okay. Um, and that is all I had to say. And um, am I turning it over to, to Alex now? Alex, take it away. All right, great. Um, that's really cool stuff, Amy. Thank you for as presented. I do not have any slides because I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go off some notes here. So and if there's some noise, they just started doing something like um, using a leaf blower or something right outside my window, which is very convenient. You know, that, that's always going to happen. And always so, that. okay. So what I'm going to talk about is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, teaching and teaching data science and kind of what kinds of things that you should be thinking about as a learner and maybe some lessons you can take away as a data scientist. So um, kind of take what you will from this. Uh, um, so as uh, Claire mentioned, I'm a technical curriculum developer um, with Google Cloud. Um, pretty new to the team, I'm pretty excited. Um, my background's kind of unusual. So my background is in computer science, but also sociology. So I actually also come from academia and I have a PhD in sociology. Um, now, uh, machine learning is not something you see a lot in, in, within sociology. It's kind of part of a larger movement called computational social science. So a lot of the uses that I focus on is this thing called computational social science, which looks a lot like data science. We use big data sets. Um, we focusing on anywhere from gigabytes to terabytes to petabytes. Um, we tend to look at data that come from different types of naturally occurring sources. So things like social media and digital media interactions. Lots of media data, but also lots of data coming from different places. So lots of social interaction data. Um, computational social science also tends to take a computational or algorithmic approach um, to data. And then I think something that's a differentiator is that we focus on starting from social theory, anywhere from domains focusing on anything like health or mass opinion or public opinion to things like political events and social movements. Okay, so my own dissertation work was building an ML system um, that tried to extract event data from newspapers um, using some natural language processing methods. Um, so um, kind of that's the who, what, when, where, why about protests and social movements uh, for folks who want to study social movements and how they affect change in, in the world. I've also studied politics and mass opinion and, and done some ML work surrounding that, okay? So my job, my former jobs and my current job have made me think a bit about how to teach high level machine learning concepts and production 
uh, I, I'm really glad that Amy highlighted the, 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 the whole ecology of building an ML system. It's not just the ML code, just the model. It's building infrastructure. It's doing the data gathering. It's doing the data cleaning. It's thinking about things like training, uh, serving SKU is thinking about those things about how people are going to be using an ML system, how people may be doing things that the ML system was not meant to do, um, that um, people are going to push the limits of the system. So an ML system is going to be a complicated system that has pretty little to do with just the ML code or the ML model, okay? And so my own, um, so prior to working at Google, I was a professor at, at the University of Toronto and um, I was teaching a lot of undergraduates and graduate students with maybe little to no background in machine learning. And, and the things that um, dealing with those students who are not machine learning folks, uh, some of them came in with some data analyst experience, is that folks think a lot about applications. They think about problems and they think about puzzles. So when you're a social scientist, you tend to focus on starting with theory or starting on a problem. And in, in businesses, in the business setting, we start thinking about what kind of insights that we can gain from our data, what kinds of problems that we're trying to solve. We start from the problem, okay? And so within social science, it's often thought about not focusing on prediction with a model, but we often think about uh, explanation. And when you're thinking about explanation, it's less about can we do kind of get a high amount of accuracy or get good precision to recall in our model and use it in serving. They're often interested in the model itself and interested in explanation and actually looking at the weights of what is being weighted highly. So when we start with logistic or linear regression, um, not particularly looking at how well these can predict, but how, what weights are actually being used and what kind of what things are being weighted. And that doesn't really make sense for saying things like image tasks, but it might make a lot of sense if you're focusing on, say, census data, or you're focusing on something where, like natural language processing, you might actually want to see which particular words are going to be weighted the highest in a particular model. So why am I saying all this? So this is, you know, like, like okay, what is this person telling me? They're talking about social science. I want to be a data scientist. Well, I want to say this for a few reasons. You're probably here because you want to enter data science or you're a data scientist who wants to sharpen their skills. Um, and I want to drill down on a few specific things and a few specific reasons why it's important to consider this. And, and this is what, the kinds of things I keep in mind while teaching data science. Is one is that you never want to really lose sight of those insights you're trying to gain from your data. You want to focus maybe on the model or trying to develop the coolest thing. Uh, um, the models are super cool right now. We have CNNs and, 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 and transfer learning and adversarial learning. And the models are getting very complicated and, and things that I um, am not in a position uh, to explain as, as well as the people who have written those papers <laughs> and said, those are cool, but you never want to lose um, sight of those insights that you're gaining from the data. Um, what kinds of questions are you going to answer? Is this model going to help me do this? Is this infrastructure going to help me do this? Can I structure that in such a way where it's going to produce some good insights? Second is that part of that is interrogating your data in light of those questions. What can your data tell you? What can it? Do you need to collect more data? What kind of cleaning did you have to do with the data? And if you're pushing your data to your limits, um, your model is only going to go as far as what your data can tell you. And the third is that you need to be able to communicate to an audience well about what you're doing and why you're doing it. You wanna use terms that show how your method answers those questions and how it can provide value. So the data scientist, one of the um, still skills that you're gonna be um, utilizing more than um, uh, you'd realize is that ability to do that translational work, that ability to take that model that you're building, take those insights you're building, and explain it to many different types of stakeholders. And so you want to be able to focus on that skill. And as you um, work through this specialization that we have on uh, machine learning on GCP, you want to think about how can I could be able to translate what I'm learning here to my boss or different stakeholders that are involved in this process. And that's something I think that um, thinking about at every step of the process is, 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 is going to give you that real edge in your data science career. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know if I have too much more than that. I wanted to 
motivate where I came from, how it translates into my teaching, and how you can take some of those strategies to think about what you're going to do and how you're going to be successful in your own data science careers. Thanks, Alex. That was, that was awesome. Yeah, I really like the point about like your models can only go as far as your data. So that's coming from a yeah. data analyst background. That's definitely like a point that really, really resonates. Uh, cool. Well, from, from Wes, Amy, Claire, Alex, and myself, we would love to please blow up the chat box. Uh, I would certainly, we'll entertain more questions. We've answered a few live while we were going along. But the long-awaited moment, I do have a, uh, while everyone's thinking of their awesome questions that they want to write, in the chat, I'm, I'm going to paste a, a link uh, to the promo code. Uh, if you access the link, it's a bit.ly link. And the instructions are, I'll also share my screen just very briefly so you can see. But that bit.ly link will take you to, I'll show you. So once you pull this link up, it'll take you to a special landing page. And again, the link is in the chat. And then you check out with one of these specializations. They're all the data focused ones. So this is the, the first specialization, which is machine learning with Google Cloud Platform. There's an advanced one. Let me see if I can't find that for you. Aha, hidden over here. The only difference between the two is this one has a blue background and this one has a white background. And it's got the word advanced, so don't get confused. Um, unless you did want to start with the basic uh, five course intro to machine learning course, you're more than welcome to. Uh, so you can either, or if you want to honestly, you can pick, pick your litter of, of any of these database, data uh, based, no pun intended, uh, courses uh, as well. Uh, so, but the one that we were just discussing is this one. You get the one month free once you go through checkout as well. And again, if you're really fast, um, maybe you can get through the entirety of the advanced machine learning course in a month. I, I, I'd be amazed personally. Um, or if you wanted to say, hey, machine learning is great, but I really want to understand more of the fundamentals of data and BigQuery. Some of the other specializations that we offer more on the data analyst side instead of the data engineering side uh, is this other specialization from data to insights, largely a BigQuery focused course. Uh, so you can kind of self-select and self-tailor your, your trial as well. All right, so that's enough stalling. I will, I'll put up the, uh, the code here as well. Uh, but again, just click on that code, complete the checkout, and then you'll automatically get that credit in your cart. But that, that the code is in the chat as well. And then I saw a question very quickly on posting the repository uh, for the all 10 courses. I'm gonna do that now, and then we'll entertain any other questions that you have. And thank you, honestly, thank you from, from the presenter crew here. I hope this was, as entertaining to you as it was to us on, on this Friday uh, uh, here in, in sunny California. And Wes, are you Kirkland based? Where are you? Are you in Seattle? Seattle, Kirkland, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Amy, are you local as well or where are you based? Seattle. Seattle as well. Okay, cool. So we got West <laughs> Coast. Much, so. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Cool. And Alex, Alex, you're in Oakland or SF? Uh, I'm at home in Oakland right now. Fantastic. So we got the whole West Coast of the U.S. Uh, covered here on our side, and I'm sure all the way around the world for, for the folks in the data science community. So uh, I'll paste in the link to the, to the repository, and we'll just scroll through the questions that you guys have uh, here that uh, po folks are populating here. But the first and foremost thing is, uh, is thank you, guys. We have uh, about 10 minutes left in the webinar, and again, we'll communicate the, the recording and the, and the links and the PDFs for what was presented. And honestly, a heartfelt thanks again to all of our presenters. We roped in like a lot of folks last minute too. Uh, so I gave them very, very little time to prep. So thank you, uh, thank you, Wes, and thank you, Amy. All right, so first question. Uh, this is a super philosophical one, I like it. Uh, at what point in time uh, does data become insight? <laughs> Do you guys wanna take that one? I don't even know if I have like a good answer for that one. I like, I like that question. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I'd say it's an question. iterative process. Yeah. Yeah, I think, oh, go ahead, Wes. <laughs> uh, I'd like to say that insights are the, are stories or the, the meaning that you can give data. That, um, oh yeah, I guess that, that <laughs> that's what I got. Yeah, what I'd like to, and, and you'll see this a little bit, if you ever take the data to insight specialization, you'll see a much larger bearded Evan. Uh, we recorded it last year when I cared much less about my personal appearance than I do now. 
Um, <laughs> but one of the things we, we cover is the difference between uh, exploratory analysis and explanatory analysis. So exploratory, you're generally just like, I have no idea what's in this data. I've given 10 terabytes of data. I can query it without worrying about hardware because I'm using something like BigQuery and I'm finding some interesting nugget. And then once I have, I, I don't know what I'm looking for and then I find something cool, then you move into, hey, there's something cool in these millions of rows of, of, of data. But I mean, that might be cool to me as like a data analyst, but my boss when presenting, I'm not gonna send them a CSV with like a billion rows. So then you shift over into explanatory analysis, which is you have an insight, but you need to communicate that effectively to whatever level your audience is. Say it's an executive level that wants to play the high level and they want it done in a PowerPoint or Google Slides, then that's, that's the way you communicate that insight. So even starting from a treasure trove of raw data, finding whatever little nugget of insight that you want to communicate, then you've got your insight, then you need to explain that correctly to your audience. So a lot of people, there's a visualization in that course, which I really like. 90% of the work done behind the scenes to tease out the insights and feature engineer your data sets, your audience generally, unless they're nerdy like all of, the, all of us on this call, uh, are not going to care about. They're going to care about that 5%, that front end to the ML model, the data dashboard that you're building, explaining that, that, that insight there as well. Uh, so finding the insights is one thing and presenting that is quite another. So. Uh, it's and as Amy mentioned, it's an iterative process. So just keep keep um, you know once you're done building the model or once you're done writing the SQL query, you know go back to the drawing board, see if there's any way you can you can make it better. And um, maybe I could uh, quickly answer a couple of questions um, directed to me. Be, be very quick. Um, first, ahead, um, for, from um, Jean Luc, are lifecycle management tools available on GCP? Um, so um, so my short answer to that is uh, take a look at. at um, uh, Kubeflow, <laughs> which is, has ties to GCP, and then um, keep, keep an ear out for, for some stuff um, coming up um, in, in, in the next um, couple months. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and then um, someone else asked um, earlier, um, direct to me, I'm, I'm currently doing a, a BTech in computer science. Um, which college should I choose for my master's? Well, I, I won't answer that because there, there are so many good ones. <laughs> um, but, but the second part of the question, um, and, and you, you can do some research to see you know, what, what the specialties are for, for the various colleges and, and which ones have strengths in this area. Um, but is it better to directly apply to a PhD um, um, instead of a master's if I'm interested in a PhD? Um, that, that's a really good question because it depends on the school. And so you'll need to research that. Some schools treat their master's and PhD programs very separately. And if you really want a PhD, you should just apply to get into the PhD program. Um, the school I, I went to was that way, in fact. Other schools treat a, a master's as just like a stepping stone on the way to a PhD. And, you know, sort of, um, it, it's kind of, kind of like one program. So, so it really depends on the school. Um, so I guess that in a nutshell, you, you need to do a little research. <laughs> Sorry to say. Awesome. Right. Thanks, Amy. Um, cool. Just going through the chat, the only one uh, that I'm purposely avoiding because I don't know a lot about it is RPA or robotic process automation. I've used some cool tools inside of Google for process automation. Uh, Wes, Amy, Alex, you guys, the question is, uh, I'd like to ask you guys your thoughts on R RPA, robotic process automation, integrated with something like machine learning tools. Uh, work, the the uh, person who's working with RPA projects and, and know if they have, they want to know if they have any strong synergy with machine learning uh, as other developers. Is anyone familiar with, I know this is kind of a, um, uh, a tough question. Uh, has anyone worked with RPA and ML before? I am not familiar. Cool. Yeah, I know there's, uh, from my experience, I actually, I went, I was in, uh, I've been in Google about three, uh, three, three and a half years. I was in Google Finance before Google Cloud. And one of the things that we focused on, there's a lot of um, uh, manual invoice processing, things that come in through PDFs. And some of the things that you can do with robotic process automation is if you're familiar with like macros and like recording a macros in like Photoshop or Excel or Google Sheets to perform a repeated action on uh, like a spreadsheet or web UI, uh, there's some really cool tools that can do um, a lot of that for you. you know, automate a lot of like really boring human manual work. Um, we're really, really good for those kind of manual review tasks. I'm not uh, as familiar as um, there are some things that I can't un mention publicly that Google Cloud Platform is working with some other uh, really cool companies on doing the, like for example, taking OCR, like optical character recognition of a, of a form and applying machine learning on that to do like sentiment analysis. Uh, but that's, uh, from what I've seen, that's, that's still um, 
or early in the stages. But if you come up with some really cool solution, please send it to us. We'd love, we'd love to, to see how, how cool ML models are being used. All right. Great. Oh, wow. We have um, a couple more questions being added. Um, do you know if TensorFlow and machine learning can be used for some kind of marketing analysis? Say, for example, uh, developing a new product. Wes, Amy, Alex, you guys want to take that one? Sure. The, the, I'll, I want to talk about the, the ML lifecycle that, that I uh, explore or that, that I had several slides for earlier. I, step one is to build a hypothesis. There, there are so many questions you can ask around marketing analysis. We've, we've done a lot of work uh, around demand forecasting. That's, that's pretty useful for marketing analysis. But, uh, I mean, does, does anybody else have ex examples where they've employed um, machine learning to marketing? Yeah, one, one example for a marketing type analysis would be doing something like if you had some kind of social media data and you wanted to analyze sentiment and do some kind of natural language processing on the text um, to see how a product was received or, or um, or now, so that's an example I've used before in types of marketing analysis. Um, so I think, yeah, as Wes is saying, it depends on what your hypothesis is. Are you trying to analyze um, uh, market reception or the kind of segmentation? So I, there's lots of different applications. Um, mm -hmm. I think getting specific on the kind of um, prediction tasks that you're trying to um, trying to specify, and then um, I think there could very well be many places where TensorFlow could give you those kinds of insights that you need. Another example might be trying to, to classify text into to different ca categories, depending on what the uh, subject matter was. And uh, not only TensorFlow, but, but um, AutoML can help with that as well. Super cool. The, the questions are pouring in. We did a, um, at Google Next, we did a, a, a full day boot camp using one of the new, uh, so I'm, I have a data, data analyst background. Uh, a lot of folks on this call have much deeper machine learning expertise than I do, so, but I, I have the unique perspective of like very heavy SQL background and I love doing everything inside of BigQuery and I'll, I'll go to TensorFlow uh, if and only if I have to. So one of the things that we uh, launched, I say we in the awesome uh, BigQuery team here in, uh, in, in Sunnyvale was the, the ability to do uh, machine learning models directly inside of BigQuery with SQL, which kind of blew me away. Uh, and one of the labs that I'll post in the chat, um, we did a full day bootcamp on using a Google Analytics data set to classify whether or not a visitor visiting your website, whether or not they're gonna come back to your website and make a purchase. Because if you have $10,000 of marketing spend, you don't wanna spend it on people that aren't likely to come back. Uh, and so this is one of the labs in the, the last part of the data insights uh, specialization, but you're welcome to take this lab on demand if you want. And it'll go through how you can create or analyze marketing data, do the classification using a BigQuery machine learning model, uh, all, all within SQL. So there's, there's, I could talk about um, this at length, but it's, it's even if you're very, very experienced in TensorFlow, if you have a bunch of data analysts on your team, uh, BQML, if you just Google that, is a, is a cool tool that comes up, that came out to use uh, machine learning on SQL. All right, uh, we have about just one minute uh, to wrap up. There's tons of questions that we'll try to answer through maybe a follow-up email. I'm extremely excited, and I'm sure everyone else is on this call that you guys are so engaged and that getting everyone to the end of a webinar, especially on a Friday is, is, a, is a hard task. So hopefully, I mean, it sounds like we did a, we did a good, good, good job holding your attention, which I'm super thankful for, but I did want to close with honestly heartfelt thanks to, to Claire for making this all possible in this whole community and to Wes and to Amy and to Alex, our featured speakers today. Thank you all. And we'll send the recording in the slides following this. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much to, to all four of you for taking the time again out of your Friday. Alex, on your birthday, um, it's been super helpful. I think we can see from the questions that it, and, and some of the comments throughout that it's, uh, it's been very informative for our community. So thank you so much um, for taking the time to do this. Thank you to everyone for coming and all of those great questions, which we will try and get you some more answers to afterwards if we can. We will post the recording and get you the PDFs and all of the links and everything that was mentioned. I'll put those um, in the community forums uh, as soon as I have them. So expect them this next week, hopefully. 
um, yeah, so thank you so much to everybody um, and enjoy your weekend. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the birthday wishes. <laughs>